Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our order of service is found on page 184. Please mark that. Our first hymn is hymn 516. We will sing the first stanza, and then later on at the sermon, uh, right before the sermon, the hymn of the day, we'll sing the remaining two stanzas. So stanza one on 516. Let us sing. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. The introit is found printed in your bulletin insert, and we speak the words responsibly. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. 
For a day in your courts is better than a palace of hell, sir. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he do withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. from the book of Amos, chapter 5. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. 
and the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. We turn to Psalm 70, found in the front of your hymn book, and we speak the words of Psalm 70 responsibly. Psalm 7. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let there be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let there be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, Aha! Aha! May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say no more. But I am poor and needy, hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, O Lord, do not delay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The Abyssal lesson is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Saint Matthew, the twenty fifth chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, They all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. 
And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We sing the remaining stanzas of hymn 560. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, all I have to say is 2020, and then the response is, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. 2020. <laughs> what a year it's been. Hopefully in January it won't be 2020 part two. 
This has been a strange year. It causes all kinds of confusion and concern about the future because we know what we've been through lately. With all this COVID-19, all of these lockdowns, all these riots, and then of course, the presidential election that technically is still up in the air. And so all of this causes concern, confusion. <laughs> what does this mean? Does it mean tribulation and persecution? Possibly. We've seen this from history. It wouldn't be anything new. But it causes that concern, what's going to happen now? But let me assure you that this is the same concern and the same confusion that's been around for centuries. In fact, approximately 100 years ago in our own country, there was this concern and confusion upon what was going to happen to our country, what was going to happen to the world. I mean, if you look back on it, realize that was just around that whole debacle of World War I coming at the turn of the century. But at the turn of the century, something else was strikingly strange in the church and the culture of America. For there was this preacher by the name of Cyrus Schofield. And Cyrus Schofield was preaching this American concept of the so-called secret rapture. And so the idea was, don't worry about the concern and the confusion about this up-and-coming world war as you are marching closer and closer. But instead, Jesus is going to come and he's going to take us up like a giant vacuum cleaner and we're just going to go up to the sky to meet Jesus in the clouds. And we won't have to worry about tribulation or persecution. We will just bypass all of the troubles of this world. Now the rest of the world, they're going to have to suffer where we live in a magical, mythical kingdom with Jesus on earth later on for a thousand years. Now, of course, this is Schofield, and this is an American just myth. But it became very, very prominent in churches here in America. Why? Because Schofield published his commentary, his Bible with commentary notes, his study Bible. So it was a reference Bible, the Schofield Bible. So it's in the Bible that your hope is found in a secret rapture. And nobody knows what is going to happen, but just in a twinkling of an eye, all the real Christians get to leave, and the rest of humanity, they get to suffer. They have the persecution and the tribulation. Well, now, this idea of Schofield codifying this into the scripture by putting it right there next to the text of God's breathed word from the Apostle Paul. This actually wasn't his invention. I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the reality of this so-called secret rapture. It actually came 100 years prior to that, around 1830. It was actually uh, this British preacher, ah, John Darby. Now, John Darby, he's the one who listed out all the proof text for this new teaching. All Schofield did is just codify it and put it inside a published version of the Bible. But it was John Darby, the British, the English preacher, who scoured through the text of Scripture to find these proof texts to prove the new teaching that his itching ears love to hear. Because, in fact, it wasn't John Darby who invented this. It was actually a Scottish preacher, <laughs> Edward Irving. He's the one who is preaching this at about the same time in 1830, saying there's confusion, there's concern in the world. 200 years before our concern. And he's saying our hope, our hope is in the secret rapture. And we don't have to worry about these things. So you blink like that and it'll be all gone. Because this is kind of what we all want. We look around and we say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to have anything to do with this. You say, get me out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. Well, this Scottish preacher, he came up with this new teaching. 
And his teaching was this secret rapture that he ironically knew was new. And so he had to say that he heard a voice from heaven commanding him to preach it. So not from the scripture, not from the written word, not from the inspired word of the Holy Spirit, but from the imagination of Edward Irving's own mind. And then lo and behold, Margaret MacDonald, one of his parishioners, claimed to have a vision that also clarified and confirmed the teaching of her preacher. Well, that's a new doctrine. It's a new idea that the church would find its hope in the secret rapture. That the church would look around and say, the world's falling apart before my eyes, but that's okay because I'm going to leave any minute now. It's not my mess to deal with. And so, all of these preachers before, the Scottish, the British, and even the American ones, they all say, our hope is in, get me out of here and beam me up, Scotty. Now, we may want to say that in 2020. <laughs> I mean, we may want to say, take us out of 2020 and throw us into 2025 or something like that into the future. But the bottom line is this. We don't know what the future holds. But we do know who holds the future. Now, whether or not the future is going to consist of tribulation and persecution which we can assume it will, because history tells us so. This is part of being the church militant here on earth. The church that is at war with the ways of the world. The church that is in an enemy-occupied territory. That this is the reality that we live in in a fallen world. But understand, and I don't want you to be misinformed, our hope is not in a secret rapture. Our hope is not in a vision or a dream extraordinary outside of the text of Scripture. The Holy Spirit gives to us the hope that we need in the written text so that we can be certain and sure what our hope is in. And so this is what the, Paul, the, uh, the, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul does in tonight's text, in today's text that the Apostle Paul himself is dealing with confusion and concern in his day. See, there's nothing new. This has been going on for centuries. As you have uh, the governments, as you have the world, as you have sin, and you have uh, Satan all just brewing and stewing with all kinds of weird things going on, nothing new. But what the Apostle Paul does is he gives to the people in Thessalonica the written text so they can be certain and sure that they hear the words of comfort. In fact, in our text, Paul even says, encourage each other with these words. He doesn't say encourage each other with dreams you may have later on tonight. He doesn't say encourage each other with visions of what you think the future holds. Instead, he clearly says, encourage one another with these words. And so at the center of these words is answering a question that the Thessalonians were dealing with in their day. There was a little bit of confusion and concern because they were very, very passionate about the gospel and about Jesus as they were converted from the pagan world and a different understanding of life and death, they were converted to Christ. And so they were ready. And they said, hey, we believe this, that Jesus was handed over for our trespasses, and Jesus was raised for our justification. We like this. We get this. We are ready to die for this. But then they wait, and then they see their fellow brothers and sisters in the faith, die. And they start to ponder and they start to wonder. They say, there's a little bit of concern here, Paul. <laughs> you said, Jesus is coming back any minute, right? Any minute. He's coming back and he's going to usher in this kingdom, the eternal kingdom. And we who have life now will then see this manifestation of eternal life into eternity. However, 
some of our fellow members have already died. Did they miss the boat? Are they not going to be here when the train leaves the station? Are they like the foolish virgins? And so Paul assures them and says, no, no. Encourage yourself with these words. We believe. Now notice that Paul gives to them a confession of faith. He doesn't tell them, seek for dreams, seek for visions. He says, take this confession of faith that we hold to, that we confess together when we gather as God's people, that we believe. And so what's the we? Well, of course, it's the writers of these texts, the writer himself and the hearers of the scriptures. It's the preachers. It's the hearers. It's the readers. It's the ones who take these words and encouraged by them what we believe in. And so yet again, as we gather as the people of God, we confess the Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, that we believe in the resurrection of the body. We believe Jesus will come again. We believe in this everlasting life. And so Paul tells the Thessalonians to encourage one another with these words. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. The gospel, the simple gospel. We don't need a vision. We don't need some other new teaching. We don't need some secret rapture. We know the reality that Jesus died and rose again. But what's very striking about the way Paul words this in the context to answer the question of concern and of confusion He says that Jesus died and rose again. Now, in the Greek language, this is going to be an active verb. It's an active that Christ is the one who died. Christ is the one who rose again. Now, in other places in Scripture, when Paul talks about the death and resurrection of Jesus, he'll use a passive voice. So he'll say that Jesus was handed over, that he was crucified by someone else that he was raised for our trespasses. But not in this passage. Paul, in particular, is going to emphasize the activity and the action of Jesus. Because if we're concerned about the future, we're confused about what's going on with those who have fallen asleep, because the ones who have fallen asleep are technically the church triumphant. Those who are alive are the church militant. And so Paul's going to clear up any confusion that we have, and he says those who have fallen asleep, okay, they can't do anything. But Jesus, Jesus died willingly. Jesus rose triumphantly. In fact, you who live, you're confused, you're concerned about the future, you can't do anything either. And so then Paul takes this understanding of Jesus is the one who is acting not the one who's being acted upon. And while we are passive and we sit back and these things are happening to us, the world's falling apart, we're concerned, we're confused, Jesus is the one who is acting. So this is why Paul will precisely say that we believe that Jesus died and rose again and through him, even so, through him. That just as Jesus is the one who willingly laid his life down for us, and he triumphantly took it back up again. It's this Jesus who is now mediating for us. It is this Jesus who now stands before the Father. So it's through Jesus who is active for us. While we sit back and we're confused, we're concerned, we know that this whole future seems out of control, but he's the one who's in control. He's the one who took the persecution and the tribulation and he faced it head on for us. And now he's the one who is actively taking the persecution and the tribulation and being with us in the midst of it, fighting for us in the midst of it. He's the one who is mediating for us. So again, if you've fallen asleep, you're the most passive you can possibly be. (laughs) You can't do anything in the middle of the night when you're asleep. You're the most vulnerable. Well, those who have died, most vulnerable. They can't do anything. 
But even though that they have fallen asleep, Jesus is the one who mediates for them now. That's the church triumphant. The church militant, those who are still alive and we think we might, maybe we could do something to change the future. Stand down. Jesus has got this under control. He's the one through him who mediates for those who are alive. And so this is why Paul is saying these are the words of comfort that you encourage one another with when you gather and you confess together in unity of voice saying this is what we believe. Now the whole world seems contrary to this, but we believe this to be true. We believe that Jesus died and rose again and through him, God is going to bring with him all those who've fallen asleep. Now, this little word with again, in theology, the prepositions are so powerful. It's with Jesus. So when we have this whole, we want out of here, just beam me up, Scotty, get me out of here, take me somewhere else, and I don't want to see any of this mess and this confusion and this concern. God gives us this picture of meeting him in the clouds. It's not a rapture. It's not a secret rapture. It's something far more profound and far more comforting. You see, when God is going to bring the fallen asleep with him, and then he's going to bring us with them in the clouds, this is pointing toward that last day. Not a secret rapture. That last day where everybody's going to know because you're going to have the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet. Everybody's going to see when Jesus returns. Not secretly. And so the whole with him is tying us together with him in the air, in this picture, as he descends to judge sin. So if we are caught up with him as he's descending to come again and to judge, our hope is not in a secret rapture, but instead our hope is that he removes us from condemnation. So if you have the picture in your mind, Jesus is descending and he's going to come again to judge the living and the dead, but we're coming with him. We're coming with him. We're coming with the judge on the final day. Because right now he's the mediator. He's mediating for us through him. And with him, we gather towards that last day. And then the judgment comes. So again, I don't want you to be uninformed about the secret rapture. There is no such thing in scripture. It's a man-made doctrine like all these man-made false teachings are. They are uh, idolatry. They're man-made ways of trying to make you feel good about yourself and your life. Where God gives us his certain word so that we can be sure that Jesus is the one who died and Jesus is the one who rose again. And even so through him, God will bring those who have died, who are most vulnerable, with him into that wedding feast. So this is the whole point of the passage, is to bring comfort in the midst of confusion and concern, not knowing what the future holds, but knowing the one who holds the future. And gathering together saying, we believe in this one who will come to judge the living and the dead. And our hope is not in this life, but our hope is in the life to come. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen.
President Matthew and our district president Roger. Bless all our pastors that they would preach your word with power and bless the hearers that they would hear and rejoice in your voice. Bless our missionaries that they have been sent to the ends of the earth, O Lord, that they would bring light in the midst of darkness. And bless us as we reside in this community. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, we pray that you would bless all of the medical researchers, the doctors, the nurses, and the hospital staff, and bless the patients, O oh Lord, who have been infected with this COVID-19. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would use this as an opportunity to exercise faith and to strengthen their eyes to look upon your Son, the only Savior, and let them see that he alone can bring healing in both body and soul, which is ultimately made manifest in the resurrection of the body. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who mediates for us, who now stands for us, who is the one who is there for us. He reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We sing stanza 10 of hymn 555. 